Um, I'm Stephanie Curtis. I'm the director of programming for NPR News, and I'm really happy to have you here. Thank you to all of you who are members of NPR. Thank you to all the Star Tribune subscribers who are here. We couldn't do this season without our sponsors, at Becker Furniture World and Bremer Bank, so a big thanks to both of them. And I don't know if you know this, but NPR only got built up with one of our um, partnerships with, with educational sponsors around the state. And I think that's a group from Luther College here tonight. So a big shout out to Luther. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, this is a partnership, of course, with Star Tribune. So I would like to invite Sue Campbell, my friend from the Star Tribune, to come on out and talk about books with me. Hi, Sue. Hi, Steph. How are you? I'm good. Good. So what are you coming up that the books lovers should know about? So I want the books lovers to know that we have a holiday book guide coming out on November 27th. So you'll want to pick that up because it will help you do all your shopping for all your fellow book lovers. That's one that thing. That sounds good. What else? Well, what I was thinking about today, I was looking at our page proofs for Sunday, and it's the two books pages that we have every week, and I was really struck by what a huge tour of the world it was giving us. There's a review about a book that's a guy who went off grid in Colorado, and another review that's about a memoir of someone's troubled adolescence, and there's another um, review about a novel that's by one of Ireland's best writers, current best writers, and I was thinking how wonderful it is to look at those pages and just get a taste of the whole world all at once, and it just makes me super grateful that we have book lovers in our community, so thank you all, and I hope you read it. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. <laughs> thank you all for wearing masks tonight. We really appreciate it. It's good to keep everybody healthy. Um, please turn off your cell phone, make sure it doesn't ring. And without further ado, I'd like to bring out Carrie Miller, the host of Talking Volumes. Hey, everyone. Thank you for being here. Do we have any librarians in the house tonight? Do we? All right, raise your hand. Thank you so much for doing what you do. Did I miss any up there in the upper? Okay, good to have you here. Um, how many of you remember your school librarian? Which I, I know, a lot of us. I have a very vivid memory of my school librarian. How about the librarian at the public library that you went to? Yeah. I, I have vivid memories of the librarian at the Bemis Point Public Library. She had this giant swirl of cotton candy hair. And, and glasses, actually, that are about the color of the ones I'm wearing tonight. She was great. She looked fun and frightening at the same time. Uh, in late August, Celeste Ng tweeted, librarians are badass, and anyone who says otherwise has never really met one. Can we applaud that? Can we say, yeah, that is right on? Tonight, we're going to enter the libraries of our memories and the library in Celeste's new novel. We're going to wander the stacks together. We're going to revel in the subversive power of the written word and the collective knowledge that libraries hold. And we're going to talk about what it means when books and librarians and librarians and readers stand up under ill-informed and ignorant assaults. Do you know where I'm going with this? Yeah. Uh, aren't you glad you came tonight for that? All right, good. Celeste Ng's new novel is titled Our Missing Hearts. Please give her the warmest welcome to the Fitzgerald Theater stage. Well. Hi. Hey. <laughs> We have a lot of, I don't know if you could see that, but we do have a lot of librarians. I heard it. And library lovers in the audience. I I, love and by it. the way, Celeste's mother, sister, and nephew are all here? Uh, sister and nephew. Okay, so, but I saw her earlier. Yeah, right, but her mother lives in the Twin Cities, which I didn't know, so that's cool. Yeah. Um, the library that I went to as a very young reader had these creaking, wooden floors that just gave no matter, and this is how the librarians knew what section of the library you were in, right? <laughs> the, the floor was creaking. And it had this, I just remember being 
really intrigued by these mysterious little card catalogs because I didn't know yes. how to interpret them, right? Um, it seemed like they held the answers to every question of the world. So what was the library like that you, of your childhood? I mean, I, I remember a number of childhood libraries, but I guess the one that was really formative for me was a library in my hometown. Uh, it was right across from the middle school. And so sometimes I would go over there after school and just kind of wander around in the stacks. It was uh, kind of a 70s sort of library, so I think they were trying to make it more open and accessible. But similarly, I remember sort of creaky floors. I remember metal shelves with corners of books that you maybe weren't sure anyone had ever looked at in the past 50 years. <laughs> And those were fun. You know, you just kind of want to see what's in there. And they had those cards in the back where you could see who had borrowed them and when, which was also really fun. And um, they had a card catalog at first, but then immediately it changed over to a digital catalog. And I, I miss those little drawers. I know. I know. I just, in fact, weirdly enough, I just ordered these vintage library cards. They're they come with little envelopes and different colors of cards that you can tuck in the envelope. This feels so ancient. It's not that long ago. No, but it feels a long time I ago. Feel with the librarians would have the ago. stamp with right, the, the date. Right, right, yeah. exactly. Uh, were you free to read above your age? Do you ever remember a conversation that your parents might have had with the librarian to say, no, let her, let her read what she will? Not with the librarian. Um, my parents always, I remember, let me read whatever I wanted. Um, they were, I'm really grateful for that, actually. I do remember a time in preschool, or so the story goes, that it was nap time. Everybody was supposed to take a nap, and I was not sleepy. So I pulled out my book, <laughs> which was a copy of The Three Musketeers. <laughs> and really? I got yelled at because I was supposed to be taking a nap. And then magically after that, I never got yelled at again. And only years later did I mention this to my mother. And she said, yeah, who do you think talked to the teacher about that? <laughs> All right. So you were allowed to read anything you wanted, even if it far exceeded, what, your age or, or your appropriateness for that? You know, I don't. I don't remember a time when I was told, no, that's too grown up for you. I don't know oh. if it was because I didn't gravitate towards those books or because my parents were fine with it or because I was just sneaky about it. I, I don't remember that, honestly. I do remember there was a time where I went to the bookstore with a friend and we were feeling very grown up. I mean, we were probably like 12 or 13. And I pulled down what I thought was going to be a historical novel about Pocahontas. And I bought it and I took it home and it turned out it was a romance novel about Pocahontas. And I, I did learn a lot from that. <laughs> yes. Things about Pocahontas you never dreamed. Things about Pocahontas that I'm not sure that the historians have fully processed. <laughs> really. Um, I was... I was. I have Susan Orlean's book about libraries. I wonder if you do too. I do. So Good. Susan Orlean and I actually grew up in the same hometown. We're you both, did. We're both from Shaker Heights, Ohio. Oh my gosh! And in the beginning of the library book, which I loved that book, uh, she talks about going to the very library I was just oh, talking about, wow. the Bertram Woods Library in Shaker Heights. How cool is this? She says it wasn't the time stopped in the library. It was if it were captured here, collected here. Mm. In the library, time is dammed up, not just stopped, but saved. It is where we can glimpse immortality. In the library, we can live forever. Oh my gosh. She's so good. She is amazing. But I think she's right. There's this sense that the library is not just, it's not just a place that information and time and thoughts pass through, but that it's collecting them, that it's kind of pooling up there in a really good way and that it's being saved for some future time where we don't know when we'll need it, but just in case it's gonna be there. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. There is a, there's kind of a sense of immortality too, right? The voices of the long ago authors, the big ideas that people had that were radical in their day still exists. Or st you could open that book and find that idea or that voice as fresh 
as it was on the day it was published. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that I really love about books is that you feel like they are talking to you across time and space, right? That's right? right. You know, a story or a poem or an essay that was written 100 years ago might speak to you right now in this particular moment about what's happening to you even though the author is long gone and those words had been penned ages and ages ago. It's one of the reasons that I love to take my laptop and write in the public library. Is that what you do? I do. I did bef more before the pandemic, but wow. I did, um, especially if I was feeling stuck, there was something really wonderful about feeling like I was surrounded by all these other voices and that if I needed it, they might just kind of lean over and give me a little nudge or a little right. hint about what I should be doing. There, there is also the sense that a library is full of potentially dangerous ideas. I mean, you're writing right to that in this novel that, I mean, we know that dictators fear this, some of the American leaders fear this. I mean, it's such a, it's, it's an incredible idea, isn't it, that you can put an, an idea in the pages of a book between two covers that is so dangerous that people want to ban it or yeah. get rid of it. It's so different from the way that I think about books and I think about libraries and I think about information generally. I mean, the idea that the information, that knowing something is gonna be dangerous to you, it just doesn't compute in my mind. I mean, my sense is that if you learn about something, you can understand it better. Mm -hmm. But I think it does speak to the power of words and language and stories that very often the first thing that a would-be authoritarian does is say, you can't tell that story. You can't use those words. You're not allowed to see this thing. What do you make of, of the new wave? You've, you're clearly thinking a lot about this, the new wave of banning books and the acceptance of that yeah, in, I, in certain parts of America. I mean, I had actually finished and turned in the edits for this book, and then I think a few weeks later, we started seeing a lot of news stories about the, the challenges towards books in school libraries and public libraries. And I had this brief moment where I felt, oh, I'm prophetic. But of course, I'm not prophetic. All I had done was I had looked at what had happened before. I mean, book challenges are not new, but there's been a huge uh, deluge of them coming in. I think what it really is, is it's an attempt to say which stories are important and which stories are not important or shouldn't be told or maybe we should even just forget about them entirely. And that feels really dangerous to me. It feels to me like an attempt to say that certain people's existence in history are not important, should not be told should maybe be forgotten about. And it's not a big step from that, I think, to saying that those people are not important and should be moved out of sight or maybe eliminated. And that, I think, is a very, very dangerous thing. You know, I think about two writers that I've talked to on this stage at either ends of the spectrum of what you've just described. Judy Bloom. <laughs> I mean, she has dealt with book banning mm -hmm. because it just, I always remember her saying, if these parents don't think their kids already know this, they are delusional. What are they trying to protect them from? Yeah, it's, it's amazing to me the idea that um, it's so often put forward, like, well, we have to protect the children from this. The idea that the, the children somehow did not know anything about it, would never have thought about this, would never have had any curiosity, interest in it, whatever, had this book not come to them. I think they've got the causality a little bit backwards. Right. And I think that's part of why books and stories are so important, because a lot of times I think we go to books when we already know a little about something, but we need to know more and we're looking for context. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's really, that's really how I think about all this information is it's context for you to better understand the shape of the world, for you to better understand your place in it, for you to better figure out sort of what your own values and instincts are. The more stuff that you know, I think the more clearly you see the landscape of the world around you. The context doesn't give you the, the ideas in the first place. Right. Right. The other author on the, on the other side of that arc is Azar Nafisi mm -hmm. and her experience of 
you know, creating this group of readers in Tehran, and they're reading all these Western novels that you would think, what does Daisy Miller have to do with any, anything that these, the lives that these students are leading, and how secretive she had to be about that, and how dangerous that was. Yeah, I think that speaks too to the sense that a story can transcend a lot of those superficial boundaries. We often here, I think, see people turning away from books because they're like, oh, it's too different. I don't, that's, that's not about me. I can't recognize myself there. And one of the things that I've been really pleasantly surprised by in past years is that people will pick up a book by a writer of color or by a writer who's from a background very different from theirs, and they'll find resonances in places that they didn't expect. I mean, that's, again, one of the powers of, of stories, that they can speak to you across those boundaries. I mean, your novels are kind of a test of that, aren't they? Well, thank you. That's a nice thing to say. <laughs> I mean, when I first wrote um, Everything I Never Told You, which is my first novel, I really was not sure, A, if I could finish the book, but B, if anybody would be interested in reading it at all, because I thought this is a book about a mixed race, Asian and white family. It's about this one very particular family situation. Who will care about this? And it's been really wonderful to hear so many people, Asians and non-Asians alike, say this felt like a reflection of something that I know. It helped me understand my family better or my mother better or helped me I had a woman at an event I did earlier say, this book made me change how I parented. Wow. And that was an amazing thing to hear. This, which book? Everything I Never Told You. Wow. And that was an amazing thing to hear. And the idea, again, that something that felt like such a particular and individual story could speak more broadly, um, it's... It's really the nicest thing that a writer can hear, I think. Just a little sidebar here. Do you think, um, do you think you ask that question of yourself every time you start, you know, a, a novel, you start to conceive of a novel and the ideas come together? Is who will care kind of the, the one of the barriers that you have to get over to, to get into the book? It's a question that I ask myself frequently, especially when I sit down to the computer. And what I realize I have to do is I just have to kind of put a pin in that question and move it to the side. Because as, as selfish as it sounds, the first person that needs to care about the story is me. Right. And any story that I go into, I go into not because I think, oh, this is gonna to speak to a lot of people. I hope it will. But I always go into it because it's something that I'm trying to figure out. Sometimes I don't even know what question I'm asking, but I know there's something there that puzzles me or intrigues me, and I have to follow what I find interesting. And then, hopefully by the end of it, it'll speak to other people too, but ultimately I have to not think about what other people are gonna think and really think about, well, what is it that I find interesting about this story? It, it sounds like you have become more at ease with asking the question and then saying, but I'll, I'll get that. That'll be revealed in some ways than you were maybe at the very beginning. I think that's right. I think one of the things that I've learned um, three novels in, I haven't learned to be faster. I keep thinking I will get faster at writing the books. Um, <laughs> I, I still have to work really hard at plot, but I've learned, for example, to follow my instincts, and I've learned that I can trust my instincts. You know, it doesn't mean that I go and I don't think about it, but it does mean that if I find myself wondering about something that doesn't immediately connect to my current project, a lot of times what that tells me is something in it Mm -hmm. resonates with the project and I have to go in there. So during the pandemic, I took up gardening uh, as, as many people did, I think, and I was trying to get my tomatoes to grow, which in Boston, where we have a very short growing season, was surprisingly difficult. And I was reading all these gardening books and to my surprise, they opened up something in this novel. And so there is a little bit of gardening yeah. in there and I didn't expect it to come from there. So I follow my instincts now more readily. I trust myself a little bit more. Were you just kind of teasing when you were talking about writing faster? Because why would you feel like you need to write faster? 
it just seems like I should have it figured some of this out. It <laughs> takes a long time, you know, and I love, I love that people ask me, you know, when is the next book going to come out? I'm like, well, I'm still doing the tour for this I know. one. A um, question I will never ask. But I think so. it, it's a wonderful thing. I think it's wonderful when people are eager for your book. And in some ways, I'm impatient too, because I have ideas that are kind of fermenting in my brain and I want to get them out on paper and I keep thinking okay I gotta let's 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 push this out and I realize it just takes a while um it is really fermenting was the word I just used off the top of my head but it is like that it takes time and you can't rush it so you talked about questions that might catalyze you into you know as the ideas are coming into form and um coalescing maybe into a novel I mean is it the goal as the writer that you will answer all of those questions for yourself or that you will just shape them in a way that makes them interesting and maybe there is no absolute answer to it and that's okay too. I come much more uh, down on the side of the second part of what you said. I don't know that there is always an answer, even for myself, and the answer that I come up with will probably not be the same answer that other people come up with. Everyone's experiences are different. But I think if I can articulate the question really clearly, mm. that's the job of the novel as I see it, to pose to the reader certain questions or dilemmas and ask them to reflect inwards and think, what would I do in this situation? Whose side am I on? Or do I feel a kinship with both of these characters? Right, that's, that's what I'm doing for myself. And I think that if, if answers come up for the reader, that's great. But I think they come from within that reader and not from, not from me and not from the book. Because, of course, we're all going to bring our different experiences and ideas and answers to the questions that you're raising. Are a lot of those questions, what if... I set these things in motion, what would happen? I mean, t tell me a little bit about the form that the questions take. They tend to take the form of why a lot of times. I think that's the question that puzzles me the most. I often start a novel with a particular image or generally with characters in a situation that puzzles me. Mm -hmm. um, for Little Fires Everywhere, I used, to, uh, I used to write in a coffee shop in my neighborhood and one day I came in and there was this kind of smoky smell in the air and all the people inside the coffee shop were saying, oh, did you hear about the fire? Did you hear about the fire? And it turned out that there was a church around the corner that had had an electrical fire and had basically burned to the studs. And I went out because everyone was talking about this fire. And I was looking at it. It was out. The building was still kind of wet. And it was still kind of smoking. And I started thinking, oh, what did it look like when it was on fire? And then I started thinking... What if it wasn't an accident? <laughs> Why would someone choose to burn down a building? And that's where that question came from, you know. And if you've read Little Fires Everywhere, you know that at the beginning of the book, it starts off saying everyone was talking about it, you know, how this particular character had burned her family's house down. So for me, it's usually a puzzle that I'm trying to unpick. And I'm trying to kind of unravel my way downwards to the source of how did we get here? And I guess I'm curious about whether three novels in? Three. Three. Unpicking that puzzle, you have more confidence in the way that you unpick that puzzle. And I'm asking this because I am often surprised by the answers that very experienced writers give about basically about self-doubt and trying to find their way through the fog of what if, what is this novel about, why am I asking these questions? So I'm curious about whether you feel like you enter into this with more confidence than you did. I'm laughing because I feel like the answer is really no, <laughs> absolutely not. It almost always is. It, you know, and I, it's true, among my writer friends, I, I think we all feel the same thing. We think we should be more confident and we might have a little bit more false confidence and then immediately into entering the new puzzle or the new story, the new book, we realize that all the stuff we learned before does not apply. Really? Yeah, it, it feels a lot like starting over because I think the, the logic of each book is different and the structure of each book is different because in a way they're asking different questions. I mean, I think if I'm doing my job and I'm, I'm trying to grow with each book, each book is going to be asking something different. It's gonna be wrestling with right. a different issue. And 
it, it, it's sort of like with every book, I have to reinvent the wheel. I have to figure out who the wow. characters are all over again. I have to figure out what the voice is. And then I have to figure out how to structure the book. And that's maybe the point where I can start thinking about what the story is. Hmm. So there's all of this sort of stuff that I think, uh, maybe the confidence comes in, it's more like faith. It's more that I accept that this is my process and at the end of it, I might come up with a book. Um, I, I feel like this is a very discouraging answer for people <laughs> out there. <laughs> no, it's, it's pretty classic, it turns out. Very few authors say, yeah, nailed it the second book and I know exactly what I'm doing. Um, I interviewed David Troyer recently, and Grey Wolf is, re is publishing his first novel, right, again, which has been an interesting experience for him because, you know, he's gone back to read it, which he usually doesn't do, and he's remembering vividly the experience of writing it and what he thought he knew. And, and this has intrigued me, this idea, he has, become a kind of writer, he said, that he didn't expect, I guess. He thought he had all the chops. He was at Princeton, you know, um, Toni Morrison was his teacher. He thought he had the chops to do this. And now looking back, he realizes that, you know, he had some of the talent, but he didn't really know who he was as a writer. Long preamble to ask you about when you started to understand who you were as a writer and get comfortable with whatever voice you were infusing each novel with. I think that's, honestly, that's a process that I'm still going through. Um, I think, again, I, I figured out some of the subjects that intrigue me. Um, there are stories about parents and children, or particularly about what gets passed from generation to generation, or what doesn't, mm -hmm. and how much we can ever communicate across generations, across um, you know, different experiences. Um, questions about identity mm -hmm. and how we see ourselves versus how we're seen by other people. Uh, questions about art and what its place is or what its value is or what its use is. But in terms of figuring out who I am as a writer, I feel like that's such a moving target. Um, I don't honestly know if at any point, even after any of my previous novels, I was like, oh no, I got this. Um, and I'd much rather, I think, be in that state of feeling uncertain and then going, okay, maybe this turned out okay, <laughs> than going the other way around. Um, one way that I'm trying to look at it is with this novel in particular, I felt like I really did want to try something new. Mm -hmm. I wanted to feel like I was stretching myself. And in that sense, what I'm doing is I'm deliberately pushing myself out into deeper water. Wow. And so feeling a little bit like I, you know, my toes can't touch the bottom, in a way I'm like, I did this to myself. Uh, but that's, that's, I think, part of how you grow. When you started to move into the deeper water, in the process. What was that like? What did you think? It's terrifying, but it's also kind of exciting. There's that, I mean, to continue the water analogy, is there, there's that feeling where you feel yourself floating, and you didn't know that you could do that, right? You can't float in water that's too shallow. Right. You have to go out into a deeper place. And it was kind of exciting in a way to feel like I was trying something new. I got to read a lot of books that I wouldn't ordinarily have. I was doing more research for this novel mm -hmm. than I usually do for a book. I was reading books and really had no clue if they were going to come into it or not. I read a lot of books about Stalin. Um, about and there's Stalin. About, there's about this much of them in there. Yeah. But I think in some ways they sort of informed my mindset. They got me knowing which questions I wanted to ask. Oh, that is interesting. Because, of course, I read your whole, I mean, the whole note about all the different books you were reading about children that were taken from their families. I don't remember seeing a long list of Stalin books in there. There's, they're, they're not. I mean, it was really more to get a sense of what it might have been like to live under an authoritarian regime right. and to get a sense of sort of the, the fear that that regime had of creativity and of people. Um, 
in, in part, I was reading those books because I was, again, trying to figure out what the subject of my book was mm. going to be, how mm. much of that was going to go in there. But I do think all of that stuff that you do where you feel like you went down a wrong turn, in a way, it ends up kind of being in the DNA of the book in some way. Um, as I was reading your book, I was also reading a novel that took, takes place in the months before the wall fell between mm -hmm. East and West Germany. You're going to Germany, so oh, yeah, it's kind of yeah. interesting. Um, the surveillance, how deeply the surveillance society penetrated not just everyday life, but consciousness and how mm -hmm. indelible that was. I mean, you are reaching into that idea. What, what interested you about that? What did you learn about that? And maybe some of this comes out of the reading about Stalin. Yeah, I was reading about that. I was reading about um, what it was like in East Germany before the fall of the wall. And one of the things that really struck me was how fearful everyone was about people that they knew. Right. right? You get the sense they're, they're afraid of the state. Okay, we expect that. But the sense that you maybe couldn't trust your neighbors, that they might rat you out if they heard you playing unpatriotic music, right? Or that they might be spying on you, they might turn you in, and this is a pattern that happens over and over again in history. And I was trying to imagine what it would be like to live in that kind of place where you couldn't trust anyone and where you felt very fearful. And in a lot of ways, the early days of the pandemic kind of brought yeah. that home. Yes. I, at least where we were at the very beginning, if you think back to March, April 2020, I remember this sense of just all pervasive fear. We didn't know what we should be afraid of. At least where I was, we were like wiping off our groceries and we were, people were leaving their mail out for a couple days because we believed, <laughs> and I think this was right, that any germs that were on it would die after two days and so you could bring it in. But we didn't know yet what we were supposed to be afraid of. We didn't know what could be a threat. So everything felt like a threat. I know. Right? You didn't know, was it okay? You know, you glimpse the delivery man outside dropping off the takeout. Was that okay? Right? You wave to your neighbor. Was that too close? I mean, we laugh now because we know. But at the time, I remember we really had no idea about what to be afraid of. And that idea that everyone might be dangerous to you. Mm -hmm. I think the pandemic really brought that home for me. I mean, what that... What that clearly does in the characters in the novel and uh, and in society is it shrinks yes. everybody to their smallest most unconfident you know just I mean it's it's terrible it it I think what it does is it emotionally kind of locks you in yes. in the same way that I think in the early days of the pandemic we we had to literally kind of seal ourselves up you didn't see anyone you didn't go outside um it's that sense, like you say, of being small, of being walled up. I think of it almost as being like a turtle. Mm, and yeah. you've pulled everything in. And of course, at that point, you're like, I'm safe. I'm inside. I'm in the shell. Nobody can get me. But nothing good can come in either. And you can't experience anything that's outside. Everyone's just in their own little turtle shell. And that's sort of a horrifying picture too, right? Where no one is speaking to anyone. No one's trusting anyone. And there's no communication. How old was your son um, during the pandemic? He was in, he was old, long enough now that I have to do math, which is kind of terrifying. Um, he was in third grade okay. when the pandemic shut down the school. Okay. So he got through half of third grade in school and then the other half was piecemeal at home. I mean, there are, there are conversations in this novel between the father and son that are they're not really straight ahead because that's not, that's risky. But it almost felt like you were drawing some of this um, experience of the pandemic and infusing that into the fear and this risk. And I can't really explain it to you straight out because in some ways there's no explanation for this. I guess I'm curious about whether you drew some of that whether that experience was meaningful in, in the way these two characters interact. I think it was. I think that was really the root of it because I remember being in this position that no parent wants to be in and yet almost all of us were in where you have to explain to your kid there's this terrifying thing happening. Right. It's happening to everybody, so we're not alone. 
but also I don't know why it's happening and I don't know when it's going to end, but I wanna tell you that it's going to be okay. And that's a really hard line to walk because I think if we're lucky, we get maybe into late adolescence or maybe even well into adulthood before we start to realize, oh, our parents don't actually know what they're doing either, <laughs> right? They're just kind of playing it by ear. <laughs> And I don't mean that as a slight towards our parents. I just mean that I think we're all kind of just faking it, and most of the time we just kind of get away with it. Right. But I feel like when the pandemic hit, many, many people were suddenly in the position of having to straight up admit to young children, we also don't know what's going on. And by extension, we're also kind of scared. We're also confused. I mean, it's a moment of, you know, of recognizing that your parent is human, really, that moment that you, you realize they don't know what they're doing. And I feel like it was a really humanizing experience for many parents uh, to, to say during the pandemic, yeah, I don't know. I don't know right. how we're gonna get through this. And then at the same time to have to say, but I believe we are, we're gonna keep trying our best. Right. And, and I think that's, that's a lot of the conversations that, that Bird, the character yeah. in the novel, has with both of his parents. They're kind of admitting to him that the world can be a terrifying place and that they don't know how to fix it, but that they're going to keep trying to fix it anyway. The contrast for Bird, um, the boy in the novel, is, and I loved how you, how you did this, that the world seems gray and small and risky and frightening, and yet there are these times when he steps into a library and the joy and the lightness and the freedom that he experiences in the library is just, it's palpable in the novel. Tell me a little bit about how you thought about that. Uh, that's the feeling that I have when I go into a library. Same here. It's, it really is, it just feels like this huge building full of potential. I mean, every book that's on the shelf, you could open up and all of this information could come out. You know, I don't even know what the appropriate metaphor would be. It's, it's, it's not even a hallway full of doors because I feel like they could be, there could be so many more doors, you know, that have to be doors on the ceiling and the floor as well. Um, it is, I think potential is exactly the right word. There's that sense that there's magic there mm -hmm. and that, um, you know, to take like a Doctor Who reference, it's much bigger than it looks like it is, right? <laughs> it's much bigger on the inside than it looks on the outside. And that's the feeling that I have about books generally, but libraries in particular, because there's this sort of mass and this history, that, that pool of of time that Susan Orlean was talking about. Yeah. So I just gave that feeling to my character. Yeah, I mean, it's just wonderful the way it's infused with magic. Okay, this would be a good time for the first excerpt. Okay. Um, and Bird is in the library. Yep. And maybe uh, you want to tell us a little bit about kind of where we're at in the story. Sure, so Bird is, uh, Bird is 12. He's been growing up uh, with just his father. His mother, uh, who's Chinese American, left the family three years before and uh, his father is, is white and has been raising him. And he's living in a world where a lot of books are being challenged. So he's, his mother's book has been removed and he's never, he's never seen it before. And he's just snuck into the university library and he's sort of looking for signs of her, her book, and in particular, a book about a fairy tale that she told him a long time ago. Bird passes shelf after shelf, slotting his fingers into the spaces where removed books once stood. There are fewer missing here than at the public library, where some shelves had been more gap than books. But still, nearly every shelf is missing one, sometimes more. He wonders who decided which books were too dangerous to keep, and who it was that had to hunt down and collect the condemned books like an executioner ferrying them to their doom. He wonders if it is his father. His father is a librarian. At the correct shelf, he slows, then pauses, tracing the call numbers along the neatly squared spines as they count down, fraction by fraction. And then, there it is, slim and yellow, hardly a book at all, barely bigger than a magazine. He'd nearly missed it. With one finger, he tips it from the shelf, the Boy Who Drew Cats, a Japanese folktale. He's never seen this particular book before, but as soon as he sees the cover, he knows it's the same story. 
a Japanese folktale, but his Chinese mother had heard it, or read it somewhere, had remembered it, and told it to him. On the front is a watercolor drawing of a boy, a Japanese boy, holding a brush, painting a huge cat on a wall. The boy looks a bit like Bird, even, dark hair grown shaggy over his forehead, the same dark eyes and slightly rounded nose. It's coming back to him, the way his mother told it, a story buried in styrofoam packing long ago that he's digging out, pulling back into the light. A boy wandering alone and far from home, a lonely building in the darkness, cat after cat after cat springing from the bristles of his brush. His fingers shake, struggling to peel the cover from the soft pages beneath. Yes, he thinks, it's almost there, like something edging out of the shadows, just starting to take shape. As soon as he reads it, he'll remember it, remember what happens, this story from his mother. In a moment, he'll understand everything. It is at this point that someone sets a hand on his shoulder, and he whirls around to find his father. They let me come to find you, his father says, instead of security. Oh, sullen mind, be kind, don't go there again. You're busy, you say, well, okay, but decay's walking in. There's a door in the floor going down to the ground to retire. There's a dent in my couch, but I can't figure out if I'm tired. I sit and spiral out of my mind. Oh, silly heart, fall apart, don't get hurt on the pieces. They are not shards of glass, time will pass, you'll find out your true weakness. Come again, a new friend, open up out the back of my window. Push you down, don't be scared, it's okay, there's a sea full of people. I sit and spiral out of my mind. What will you give me? for you and bends time reaching towards the end. Forgive me, my dear. Open up. Give it back. I can hear you. Won't you shatter the past, draw the curtain, look back on the real you? If they said it won't be, will that satisfy me? Will it haunt you? Don't listen to them, I'm a fox in a den, not a cub. I sit and spare. Don't leave yet. Um, 
I'm just so interested in the story of that song. What's, Me too. What's, how did you choose it? It, was, it seems like perfect for our conversation. <laughs> um, yeah, this song was written during a pretty anxiety-ridden evening and also was sort of inspired by, I was watching the Bob Dylan documentary, um, oh my gosh, why can't I think of that? Oh, Roll the Rolling Thunder Review. Um, so sort of sonically, the music was inspired by that, but it was more just my anxiety that I was trying to quell. <laughs> <laughs> it's just got this ominous building, um, I don't know, there's even a sinister quality. I don't know, what, what do you think? I was thinking the same thing. I feel like the sense of foreboding yeah. in, the, in the, the chords, but then also in the words as well. Yeah, sort of um, hard to escape feeling overwhelmed and anxious, I guess, is, uh, I guess that's the representation of how the <laughs> thank music Thank you for being right. here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> You're listening to Talking Volumes at the Fitzgerald Theater with writer Celeste Ng. Her new novel is titled Our Missing Hearts, and I'm Carrie Miller. You've put the mother, Margaret, in this novel in an impossible, impossible situation. She's got the most terrible choice, I think, that a mother could make. Um, I want to, I'm going to read a little bit from the scene where she leaves in just a minute, a couple lines, but um, were there questions? Were there some of those what if questions, what would happen questions? How did you work up to writing those scenes? I think Margaret's struggle really grew out of the fears that I have as a parent mm -hmm. um, about what's best for my child and how how can I best prepare him for the world? And those are very, very big questions. And for her, her presence in a lot of ways puts him in danger. And I think in some ways about the fact that now that I am in some ways a public persona, is that bringing attention to my family uh -huh. that I don't necessarily want? So Margaret is not me, but I have questions again about the ways that parents live their lives and how that might have repercussions mm. for their children. Mm -hmm. um, it was funny the way you said public persona, like you didn't even want, want to acknowledge that. You kind of flinched <laughs> when you said that. Is that how you feel? A little bit. Um, I mean, I, mostly I just feel like me, but then I go out into the world and I hear you know wonderful things where people tell me that their my books mean a lot to them, yeah. or you know people will ask me, can you talk to me about what you think about the uh, the upcoming presidential elections? <laughs> uh, I'm I'm going to Germany in a couple of weeks, and I did a rep uh, an interview with a reporter over Zoom, and they were like, well, we just have a few questions for you. They're like, how do Americans feel about Joe Biden? Oh my gosh! And I was like. I think what I said was, this is above my pay grade to answer. <laughs> I don't think that I can speak on behalf of all Americans. You know, but it's a strange position to be in um, when it feels like people might actually listen to what you have to say. I think that means you have to be very careful about what you do say. And as a, an Asian American, I think I'm often asked to speak for Asian Americans, and that's something that I don't think that I can do, nor should I do. I think I can speak about my experience, and I can try and speak to Asian Americans, but that sense of being a spokesperson is something that makes me feel very anxious. Yeah, how do you sidestep that? And why do people think that that is your job or your role? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I think it's because for a long time, we haven't allowed very many Asian Americans, or broadly speaking, people of color, to have a say. Uh, generally, we tend to have sort of one chosen one. Yeah. Uh, many years ago, before I even published my first novel, I wrote an, an article, an essay, really, that I still get asked about called Why I Don't Want to Be the Next Amy Tan. And this wasn't a slight at Amy Tan at all. I love Amy Tan. I think she's amazing, and her work has been really important to me. But what I said in the piece was that idea of being the next Amy Tan is pretty loaded. It yeah. suggests, first of all, that there can only be one. So it's like I've got to like punch her off her pedestal. 
and then I can take the throne. You know, and I, I'm like, I don't want to punch her off her pedestal. I want her to keep writing her books. She's great. But it also suggests in some ways that we are doing the same thing right. and that we, there's only one path forward. If I want to be an Asian American, I can only be compared to Amy Tan, right? And therefore, I must do the same things that Amy Tan did, but better, so that I can supplant <laughs> her and become the next chosen one. And I, I don't think that's how it should work. And so to your question about how do I sidestep that, that feeling of, you know, please be the spokesperson and tell us how all Americans feel about Joe Biden. Um, what I try and do is I, I can speak for myself, but make clear the limitations of that, and then try to make space for other voices. I mm -hmm. think that's the only way out of this. There's an amazing essay and TED talk, I think, by the writer Chima, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. And she talks about the dangers of a single story, where essentially what she says is, if you've only got one story that is supposed to stand in for a whole group's experience, it's doomed to fail, because it can never encapsulate everything. And the only way out of that is more, more stories, more facets of all of these experiences. And, and I think bringing other voices into that conversation is, is one way to get that more. One thing I've... I've always wondered about what you're talking about as far as there's, there's one represented author mm -hmm. and they are the one we lift up. I, I, I think Jacqueline Woodson and I talked about that, that um, I, I'm always curious about the chicken and the egg thing. Is that because that's what the public will accept and so that's what the publishers give them or you know, it does it start with the industry and that's just, these are, these few authors. I don't, do you have a view on that? I don't know, honestly. I'm trying to figure that out myself. Yeah. I think if we can crack that, that may be one of the ways that we solve the kind of endless cycle of there only being one chosen one. I know that the publishing industry, I think, wants to diversify itself sometimes, and it wants to bring up a voice in particular, and those voices don't always, they don't always catch on for yeah. whatever reason. And so there, there must be more to it just than that, you know, the, the industry is pushing one particular person. They don't have that control. I don't know what it is. There is a chemistry there, I think, between writer and story and reader. And we haven't figured out what that formula is. There may not be a formula at all. Does it feel better than it has been in a while? Or, or how does it feel right now? I don't want to assume that. I think we're making progress. I have been thrilled because I have seen many more books by Asian women writers, but by women of color and people of color generally, and then marginalized writers. I've seen more stories coming out and they're being allowed to tell more kinds of stories. Right. For a long time, I think that if you were, for example, a Chinese American writer, people expected you to tell a particular kind of story. It was maybe going to be a story about immigrating to this country and then finding that it was really hard, but eventually finding your place and realizing that America was welcoming you. Or it was going to be a story uh -huh. about how... It was um, fiction, right? Right. Yeah. You know, or... Uh -huh. And those stories exist, but they're not the only ones, right? Or they expected it to be a story about struggling um, against your restrictive parents, and you wanted to be free and do these things, and your parents did not, and eventually maybe you found peace or you struck out on your own, right? There are certain narratives that were prescribed in a way. And now I think we're getting to see more stories in which the ethnicity of the writer and the ethnicity of the character is part of the story, but it is not the only part of the story. And it maybe isn't even the main part of the story. It's just one of the factors that go into a much bigger piece. And that I feel like is progress. We have to see how far it's gonna go. Yeah, I feel like you've, you've just kind of defined what you were saying with, I don't want to be the next Amy Tan. I mean, she, the, the novels she writes and what you're writing about are very, very, di come from really different places. Yeah. Wonderful, and, both of them, but. And, and that makes sense to me because we are, we are different people. Right. We've had different experiences. We have different relationships to our ethnic heritage. And we grew up in different times. Um, I think Amy Tan's first book came out when I was four or five. And so I remember it being on the bookshelf at yeah. my parents' house. 
So it makes total sense that her view on things is gonna be different from mine, and likewise, the next generation's view of things is gonna be different from mine, and that to me seems like a good thing. It seems to me like we are evolving and having more space for those stories. Was that the Joy Luck Club? The Joy Luck Club, I believe, was her first, yeah. And do you I wanted... remember, um, so you remember seeing it on bookshelves? I do. Do you remember I, reading it? I do, I didn't read it until I was a little bit older because, um, I, I don't remember being conscious of it until I was maybe about 10 or 11, mm -hmm. and I think it was around that time that the movie was coming out, right. and it was a big deal. And I remember my mother was really excited about it because it was the first movie that had an all-Asian cast since Flower Drum Song, which came out, I believe, in the 60s. Wow. And then it was another really long period before another one until Crazy Rich Asians fairly yeah. recently. So I think <laughs> when you... So what's 30 years in Yeah, between? just, you know, a couple decades right. in there. But I, I think that's part of it is the sense, that's part of how we get to, you know, the idea of there being one anointed one. When there's such scarcity, right? there's that sense that you got to take whatever representation you can get. And you're going to rally behind that. And that's a wonderful thing. And if we're getting to a point where there are many more pieces of representation, let's say, uh, to me, again, that feels like a good thing. There's much less scarcity. Right. Um, I, I want to come back to this scene where Margaret is um, realizing that to keep her child safe, she has to vanish. And, um, I, you know, let me ask you this question. Was there literature or journalism that you turn to to think about, to write into this scene and to think about a choice like this? Honestly, a lot of it really is just me digging into okay. the character. Um, I spend a lot of time doing what I call writing off the page, meaning that I'm writing things in a notebook or in a whole separate file that are not intended for the book. Sometimes pieces of them end up in, in the text in the end. But they're my ways of kind of letting the character just kind of talk and getting mm -hmm. to know their voice, getting to know what they think about and really kind of getting to know how they would act. And all of that really comes just out of me digging into who I think this woman is and why she would make these choices. Okay, that, that's um, interesting because the scene is so, there's kind of a spareness, I think, to the scene. Um, she tells her son who's playing in his room that she's leaving, and of course he doesn't know that she's leaving for however long. And you write, he did not turn around and she was grateful for this. Grateful not to see his eyes in this last moment. Grateful that he did not run to her and press her face into her belly as he usually did, because how then could she ever hope to peel herself away? Makes me tear up to even read that. Right now, I mean, that's an extraordinary scene. I mean, some of that comes from my memories of dropping my toddler off at daycare. Um, if he, it, it, it sounds silly, but it's true. I mean, the, you know, maybe some of you who chuckled have the experience of trying to detach yourself from a child who really wants you to stay. And you know that in five minutes, they will be happily playing, and when you go to get them in a few hours, they will not want to leave. You, you can know that consciously, but it doesn't make that moment in which they're clinging to you and asking you to not go, it doesn't make that moment any less painful. <laughs> right. Um, you mentioned everything that you read to prepare uh, and while you were writing that the scenes you, you write in the novel about children who are taken away from their families are just wrenching. And of course, we're in a place where the state and other authorities did this to Native American families for years. I think, I think the state of Minnesota had 16 quote unquote boarding schools. Mm -hmm. what, what did you read about what Minnesota did and what some of the other states did for Native American. I didn't read a lot about Minnesota specifically. It, unsurprisingly, it's, it's sometimes hard to find books that look at this in depth. And wow. I think because as a country, we don't want to talk about these things. Uh, I read a lot more about the, the so-called Carlisle Industrial School in uh. Pennsylvania. Um, and interestingly, soon after I turned in this book, um, my mother emailed me and said, did you hear that the Pope is coming to Canada? Because they also had so-called residential schools. And the Pope uh, just recently went up to Canada, is 
part of trying to apologize and make reparations. I read some. I didn't want to read too much because I wanted in some ways to keep a little space between that experience and the experience of the kids in the book, which is different. I, don't, I didn't want to be taking that experience mm -hmm. and, and sort of just putting a, a, a different color on it and, and making it into something else. But I did read stories from adults who had been at the boarding schools or in the residential schools and what their memories of them were. And what struck me was that their memories were often very piecemeal. I'm sure they remembered more, but the huh. things that they were able to speak about were very specific. In a way, that they, had to, they had to kind of build a little wall around this kernel of story. Wow. And so many of them would talk to their children, and their children are now adults, and their children would say, she wouldn't talk about that. She'd only tell us about this one particular nun or this one particular teacher or this one particular day. In a way, I think it was, you had to make it small enough to take in. And if you heard the whole experience of it, it might be overwhelming. And so I tried to read just enough of it in a way to get a sense of what had happened in the past so that I could imagine how, in this scenario, that might play out. I mean, it, it reminded me that, um, you know, when people, and I'm sure you run into people who say, I don't read much fiction. I want true stuff. I want to read nonfiction. You know, and I have this discussion a lot with, uh, with readers, not to, not to put down nonfiction at all, but is there anything ever more true than what you read in fiction? I'm, I'm biased. But I think Good. fiction, I mean, I think fiction gets at a different kind of truth. Um, ages ago, I remember being out, uh, I think I was just sitting outside eating in a park and I heard this group of young businessmen sitting, having a little chat <laughs> over their outside lunch. Uh, and one of them said something like, oh, you know, this, this memoir that I was reading, it was so much more meaningful because it really happened. <laughs> uh -huh. And I, I understand that feeling, but I think that there are different goals in those kinds of literature. I think that something like memoir and nonfiction, I really admire people who can write it because I cannot. Um, I have difficulty in sticking to the facts. And one of the joys of writing fiction is that you can kind of change things so that it, it's a little neater, it's nicer, it fits together better. A friend of mine who's also a fiction writer calls it life editing because she says, you know, things don't happen neatly in life, but in fiction, you can make them work perfectly. But I think that nonfiction, I think its power is really in that it's asking us to witness something and it's asking us to to go in trusting that this happened. So if you think about memoirs, which are often about things that people have endured, in a way, what they're saying is, I'm gonna testify to you, and I'm gonna tell you about this thing that happened to me, and you're gonna feel its power because you believe I'm telling you the truth. And in fiction, I think we go about it in the opposite direction. We say, I'm gonna tell you something that is not true, completely made up, it's made up, I, I made up all these people, all these scenarios, <laughs> but you're gonna feel that it's real, even though you know that it's not true. And for me, that's kind of the magic of it. It oh, is like yeah. a magician saying to you, I'm gonna do this thing, and then they do it, and you know it's a trick, but it doesn't make it any less cool to see it, and in a way, it's got a different power, because you're believing in this even though you know these people are not real. And I feel like that's a little stretch that, that is so worth taking. So that's always my argument for, for fiction and for the truth that fiction pulls out. I, I read something that you wrote about this in 2008 where mm -hmm. you were writing about memoir and I just, I'm gonna steal your argument the next time I hear somebody go, but I want it because it's true. Um, you wrote, by its nature, memoir says, this happened, this really happened I, and I must tell it. It's spurred by a desire to go on the record, to be heard. But fiction's role is essentially persuasive. It forces you to start from a position of disbelief by announcing its own fictitiousness. Then it transforms you into the literary equivalent of a sinner seeing the light, a prodigal son whose faith is stronger. It's good, isn't it, <laughs> for having I doubted. think I said it more convincingly there. <laughs> and been redeemed. 
You don't question a memoir. You believe it's true when you pick it up, but you are told from the beginning that fiction is untrue. It depends on its own power to convince you in spite of this knowledge. And that belief, when it comes, is a complete transformation. And this is why we need fiction. Hurrah! <laughs> it's true. I, go ahead, you want to add I to that? I was gonna say, I remember, I remember that I was writing that at a time where there was this real concern about a lot of so-called fake memoirs. Right. Um, there were a lot of questions being asked legitimately about how much of memoirs needed to be true and if they could be disproved, right? And if one part of it could be proved to not be true, there was one, I believe there was a, a person who remembered, um, I think someone in a concentration camp or a prisoner of war camp throwing apples over the fence, you know, um, to someone else. And they, they went back and they said, oh, this could not possibly have happened because the fence was much too tall and this was that, so therefore the whole thing is not true. And I felt like that was kind of going down the wrong path in a way, that memoir is not necessarily trying to be specific about those things. And it's not necessarily trying to do the same things that fiction is. People were saying, oh, memoir and fiction are basically the same thing now. And that was my response to saying, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. I think they're very different. <laughs> For sure. Just, um, I, I just have one question um, before we hear another excerpt and some music. Uh, are both of your parents physicists? They were both career no, physicists? No, my, okay, my dad was a physicist, and my mom was, I think she would say, is a chemist. My father's passed away. A chemist. Uh, my okay. mother is retired, but I think she still thinks of herself as a chemist. And um, that's very much her personality as well. I mean, she is a scientist by nature as well as by profession. How, how did two scientists come up with some dreamy fiction writer whose head was in the clouds and I, person was in the library? I suspect that they asked themselves that quite a lot. <laughs> and, and my sister who is here is an engineer. Oh, and, oh my gosh. And we've, she's one of a, quite a lot of engineers in my family. I think we've got like six or seven of them, not counting wow. the ones that married in. Um, Where is she? I, I don't want to point, I'm not going to embarrass Oh, she's right her. over oh, there. She's embarrassing okay. herself, it's fine. Glad you came. Um, I don't know. I mean, one thing is that I think that we think of science and art as being these polar opposites, and I don't know that they actually are. Mm. I think that fundamentally in both of them there is this kind of what if question yes. that drives both of them. And they approach it from different angles, but fundamentally I think you are trying to figure out causes and effects. Um, one of the things that's been hardest for me to learn as a fiction writer is plot. And people don't believe really? me when I say that because <laughs> um, I hope my books seem well plotted. But it doesn't come naturally to me. I, I think a lot about characters and my early stories had a lot of characters sitting around and not doing anything. They were thinking and remembering and feeling a lot and there was very little action. And a wonderful professor of mine in grad school would read my story drafts and say, you know, this is great. You've got wonderful characters. Your writing is fantastic. This is a good setup. All you need is a plot, and then you will actually have a story. <laughs> and she was right. And so I think about this now when I write. I think about plot as being essentially a cause and effect, which is if this thing happens, it makes you do this. Or you do this because of this thing that happened. Well, why did that thing happen? Because this thing happened. That's how I tend to approach plot backwards. And I think that science yeah. fundamentally is doing something similar, which is, well, why does this thing happen? Well, if I do this a bunch of times, will it always happen? Oh, well, what if I do this? Will this thing still happen? You're trying to figure out what the causality is. And so this is a long way of saying maybe I took my parents' kind of what if and I just approached it from a different direction. That's such a good answer. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> such a good answer. All right. Would you read our, our second excerpt and set it up however you, okay. however much you want to um, give So away. a big part of the book is Bird is looking for his mother who's, who's gone away. Um, he, he gets a letter from her at the very beginning of the book, and he's drawn into this sort of quest to find her. And I don't think it's spoiling too much to say that at a certain point they do, they do have conversations. So this is a little moment in which I think he's, 
he's gotten a sense of why his mother left him. He started to understand a lot more of what her story is and to see their relationship in a different way. And that's a little bit terrifying for him. And so this is, this is a moment that they have together. Uh, I guess I should say also, uh, how do I do this without giving things away? They're in a secluded area, let's say. Yeah, he's, he's, he's in a dark room at the beginning of this, literally, as well as emotionally. Outside, he expects only more blackness, but instead what he sees is a dizzying array of light. Lights glimmer from window after window, window in a glittering mosaic, a sea of lights, a tidal wave of lights, washing down over him in sparkling droplets. Each of those lights is a person, washing dishes or working or reading, completely oblivious to his existence. The thought of so many people dazzles and terrifies him. All those people out there, millions of them, billions, and not one of them knows or cares about him. He claps his hand over the hole, but he can still feel the light sizzling against his skin like a sunburn. Even curling up inside the sleeping bag, the covers pulled over his head brings no relief. Out of him pours a cry so long buried, the sound of it is like an earthquake in his throat a name he hasn't uttered in years. Mama, he cries, stumbling out of bed, and the darkness reaches up and tangles around his ankles, tugging him to the ground. When he opens his eyes again, he's curled up tight in a ball, and a hand rests warm and heavy on the tender V between his shoulder blades. His mother. Shh, she says, as he tries to turn over. It's all right. She's sitting on the floor beside him, a less dark shape against the dark. You know, I felt the same way, she says, the first night I spent on my own. Her palm, warm and soft on the nape of his neck, smoothing the hairs that bristle there. Why did you bring me here, he says at last. I wanted, she begins and stops. How to finish. I wanted to make sure you were all right. I wanted to make sure you would be all right. I wanted to see who you were. I wanted to see who you had become. I wanted to see if you were still you. I wanted to see you. I wanted you, she says simply, and this is the only explanation she can give, but it is what he needs to hear. She had wanted him. She still wanted him. She hadn't left because she hadn't cared. The understanding seeps into him like a sedative limpening his muscles, scooping smooth the hard edges of his thoughts. He leans against her, trusting her to bear his weight, letting her arms twine around him like a vine around a tree. Through the tiny hole he's poked in the window covering, a thin strand of light pierces the black plastic, casting a single starry splotch on the wall. Such a beautiful place. I'm starting to hold you in a tight embrace. Conversation, it comes and goes. It's the space between the words I remember most. Disappointment will never overtake. You can let it go and let love be made. I'm starting to see you in a different way. I'm 
I'm starting to face you in a while comes the cold and away it fades if life doubts you don't be You can, you can, you come apart. Don't be afraid to show me who you Listening to Talking Volumes at the Fitzgerald Theater with Celeste Ng. Her new novel is Our Missing Hearts. And I'm Carrie Miller. And we can bring up the uh, house lights for questions. We have microphones, yeah, people with mics in the audience. And if you want to ask a question, just raise your hands. There's, yeah, everybody's looking around. No, you go first. No, you go. Right over on that side. Hi, good evening. Hi. Um, I was wondering how often you write poetry since it's so central to the novel. Oh, this is such a nice question. Um, I, I have to admit, I don't write poetry anymore. I wanted to be a poet when I was a teenager. I thought that I, I thought poetry was my medium. And in fact, I told a creative writing teacher in high school that I didn't like writing fiction and I only liked writing poetry. <laughs> Um, I just realized that that teacher is going to come to my event tomorrow, and she's probably going to be smug <laughs> in Ohio, about it. right? Yeah, I'm um, going back to Cleveland, my hometown, tomorrow. Um, I read a lot of poetry. Um, is is maybe the real answer to the question? I don't I don't write it um, because I tend to. It gets longer and longer, and I think poetry, one of its powers, is that it it works in a really small space. But I read a lot of poetry, um, just for my own joy, and I read a lot of poetry while I was writing this novel. And I also realized I, re I read a lot of poetry during the pandemic. It was one of the things that I turned to, especially in those early days, when I felt like everything was pointless and how do we get through this? Um, reading poems in, in some ways reminded me of how to get through it. And I think that's how the poetry crept into the book. Which, which poets did you turn to during the pandemic? Oh, a whole bunch. Well, one of them is Ross Gay, who's coming to, yeah. to speak here in just like a couple Ross of Gay weeks. Ross Gay will be here next Wednesday, everybody. Uh, it's going to be great. He's an amazing poet, I think, because we sometimes think about poetry as being about the things that um, we're anxious about or about sadness. Like, I think we're, we're given those poems a lot in school. You know, they're poems of mourning, and that's one of the things poetry can do. But there are also a lot of poems out there that I think find beauty and joy in very small moments. And Ross Gay is an amazing writer at that. He finds joy in very, very small things. And then when you read them, you start seeing joy everywhere. And that's one of the things that I think poetry can do. It can kind of turn those moments around. That's great. Question right back there on that side. Hello. Hi. <clears throat> in Little Fires Everywhere, how did you come to the decision to write about mothers and who gets to be a mother and tie those? I, I saw that there were like four strands of motherhood within that book. Yeah. Um, I think I came to those questions because they were just questions that I was wrestling with myself. I was a parent at that time, and I was struck both by how many expectations we have 
about mothers and what mothers should be doing in our society. I mean, if you even just go, if you're at the grocery store and you look at the celebrity magazines, a number of them will be about, oh, so-and-so finally having a child, or so-and-so says she never wants children, so-and-so left her child behind, so-and-so has decorated the beautiful nursery. <laughs> There's so many ways that we expect mothers to behave, and generally speaking, normal human beings can't can't do all those things. And so I was feeling a lot of that, and I was really interested in the ways that we judge mothers and that mothers sort of are held up as these sort of standards. So as with everything, um, those questions kind of came out of me trying to figure out how, how do I act as a parent, and how do I now see my own mother's parenting differently? I understand why she did certain things, um, you know, why she would teach me certain lessons or whatever, in ways that I definitely did not understand when I was a teenager. Uh, question right up there on the second level. Celeste, thank you so much uh, for being here for this amazing book. I absolutely loved it. The very uh, passage that you read, um, when birds uh, cries out, mama, was a, a point in the book that just literally brought tears to my eyes, so thank, thank you. you. Um, I had a question which I thought was so fascinating in this book, was a very intentional decision of your dialogue. And there's no quote marks <laughs> in the dialogue, and you know, very different from Little Fires Everywhere, et cetera. And it seemed so beautifully intentional. And I just was curious, could you just comment on how you constructed the dialogue in, in the way you did? This is a great question. This is, we talked earlier about following instincts and when I started writing the book and I was figuring out the tone, I realized I was writing without quotation marks and I will apologize to those of you who don't like that because I admit that I find it really irritating when writers don't use quotation marks. <laughs> and so I had this moment where I had to look and go, okay, why are my instincts leading me that way? Am I just being lazy? Um, what is it? What I eventually realized was that a large part of the book has to do with stories and storytelling, and not just stories uh, as told in books, but also stories that are, are literally told in a spoken way. Um, bedtime stories, for example, and in particular stories that are passed on um, sort of covertly, right? Things that are maybe being whispered from, from mouth to ear. And one of the things that happens when stories are told that way, that's really interesting, is that the, the voice of the person who is literally speaking to you and the voices of the characters in the story start to blend together. And that gives the story a little bit of a dreamlike feel, but it also kind of blurs story and reality. It blurs past and present. And I realized that was the feeling that I wanted the reader to have when they were reading this book. It's a feeling that the characters have. Um, it, it, you know, in TV and movies, sometimes when you have a flashback, there's a very neat cut, yeah. right? There's a little splice, or you get the like Wayne's World kind of like thing that happens, and then you know you're in a flashback, and then it ends, and you and then you're back to reality. And I think that the way that we often experience the past when it wells up is a little bit more nuanced. It's it kind of is is overlaid over the moment that we're having now. And so not including, uh, not including quotation marks was one way to try and give the reader that feel, that feel that maybe this book also is a story that's being told to them. I mean, there's a couple times too where the characters don't realize they've said something aloud and there's this really seamless, you feel like you are really in their consciousness and not kind of watching this from the outside. Yeah, it's a, yeah. a little bit of blurring of inside and outside right. too. I, you know, my my sister has what she she's like. Did you say that in your outside voice or in your inside <laughs> voice? Yeah. By by which we mean like, did you actually say that out loud or did you just think it to yourself? And in this book, there's a little bit of blurring of that sometimes um, when characters will say things that they didn't realize they were saying or they don't say things, but they only say it and hold it within them, and that's part of the story too. Those secrets that that you hold in sometimes. Question right over there. Hi, um, I, while reading this book, I had a lot of the same feelings and thoughts that I was experiencing um, during the summer of 2020, especially in Minneapolis um, and the murder of George Floyd. And I was wondering if or how that event and like events following that had any influence 
on your book. It really did, and thank you for asking that question. I was thinking, um, just driving around the city today, um, both how we have come far from that and also how we have not come very far from, from those events. Um, I think like a lot of people, I watched those events with horror and anger, but also like really hoping that that was going to be a moment that finally something would change. Um, and I put a lot of those feelings into the book. There, there is a, a crisis that happens in the book, that's what they call it, um, which is a period of unrest, and it starts off being economic, but it leads to social unrest, and it leads to people kind of watching demonstrations and um, many kinds of protests happening and, and feeling like the society is at a breaking point. And in this book, the society kind of he heals by basically insisting that everyone's gonna kind of double down on patriotism. And it, spoiler alert, it doesn't work super well for them. <laughs> but I was thinking a lot about how faced with these problems, I mean, they, they were not new problems, they were not problems that came up suddenly in that time period, never existed before. They were just the problems that I think had finally welled up, you know, that many people had been grappling with for a long time and that now a lot of people were not able to ignore anymore. And so I was asking myself a lot of questions, like, I, I hadn't been thinking about those things until I saw a lot of the demonstrations that happened. And I feel a lot of guilt about that. And what do we do with that feeling of saying, like, you know, I had been allowed to not think about those things. And many other people had to think about those things on a daily basis. And likewise, feeling, because we were in the pandemic at that point already, feeling like, now that I know there are these huge problems and they're, they seem so pressing, we've got the pandemic, which is global, we've got all the issues around police brutality and just generally racism in our society, all kinds of huge issues. As one person, I was feeling very helpless and particularly as a writer. Um, in, in, in that time period, I was really kind of having an existential crisis and I was sort of thinking like if I were a doctor, I could be in hospitals and I could be maybe trying to save people's lives and help with the pandemic. If I were a scientist, I could be maybe working on the vaccine or doing something. If I were like a labor organizer, I could be organizing people and trying to make a tangible change. And I am in my office with my laptop making up stories. And I was really thinking about this question of what can one person do in the face of these huge problems? And what can art do? And I guess it ties to the question about poetry. One of the things I realized was that I was turning to art to try to make sense of this and to try to get through this and to try to inspire me to keep going. I was reading about previous times when people had made change, right? I was listening to music that inspired me and made me think, okay, maybe it is possible to change people's minds, to change systems. Um, and so all of that, I think, f started to feed into the book because they were the questions that I was asking. Can one person make a difference? Can art play any kind of role in changing the world? I don't think it's gonna magically change things, but can it inspire people? Uh, a friend of mine who's also a writer, we would talk um, on Zoom through the pandemic about how our books were not coming together. And what they said to me was, you have to give the problem of your novel to your novel. And by that, what they meant was the questions that feel like they're keeping you from writing the novel, those are actually the questions that your novel's trying to answer. And so you should kind of lean into that. And so it was, I'm, I'm really grateful that you shared that you felt that because that was definitely a part of it. Thank, Thank you. you for all of the great questions. Should we do a book signing? Everybody ready for that? Okay. <laughs> Celeste, thank you so Thank much you, for Carrie. coming. Thank you all so That's much wonderful. for coming.